Chapter 12, Taking Flight Airplanes will eventually be fast. They will be used in sport, but they are not to be thought of as commercial carriers. To say nothing of the danger, the sizes must remain small and the passengers few, because the weight will, for the same design, increase as the cube of the dimensions, while the supporting surfaces will only increase as the square. Octave Chanute, American Aviation Pioneer, 1904. 12.1, Profile, Juan Trip. Quote, to provide mass air transportation for an average man at rates he can afford to pay. One trip's stated goal for Pan Am. The Tripp family were bankers descended from English seafarers who had settled in Maryland in the 1600s. Born in Seabright, New Jersey, Juan Tripp, 1899-1981, attended Yale, where he played football and served as a Navy flyer during World War I. Tripp formed his first airline, Long Island Airways, to provide taxi service in the New York area to other wealthy gadabouts. While Long Island Airways failed, he and his classmates from Yale, William A. Rockefeller and Cornelius Vanderbilt Whitney, great-great-grandson of Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt and son of Harry Payne Whitney, and thus a second cousin once removed to Henry Melville Whitney of the New York Metropolitan Street Railway Company, joined Colonial Air Transport in 1922, which was a beneficiary of the federal airmail contracts serving the Boston to New York market and added passenger service in 1927. While not Hispanic, Tripp used his name as a way to enter the Latin American markets. The source of his name, Juan, is disputed. After clashing with Colonial over expansion, which Tripp favored but the stockholders opposed, Tripp formed a new company, Aviation Corporation of America, in 1927, and using his name as an aide, obtained Cuban landing rights from Cuban President Gerardo Machado. However, when the airline won the landing rights, it had no airplanes, no money, and no contract. One competitor had the airmail contract but no landing rights, a third company, Atlantic Gulf and Caribbean Airways, had access to Wall Street financing. These three companies, none of which were operating planes at the time, merged and adopted the name Pan Am from one of those newly merged companies, run by Henry Hap Arnold, who went on to run the Army Air Force during World War II. In 1927, the new company under Tripp's leadership was able to provide airmail, and by 1928, passenger service between Havana, Cuba, and Key West, Florida. Tripp successfully used the levers of government, both U.S. and non-U.S., to further private ends, making Pan Am effectively the U.S.'s flag carrier. With airmail contracts lined up in Latin American markets, the State Department would work on his behalf to ensure that a monopoly position were possible. Tripp then used Pan Am's dominant position in the air carrier business to play airframe manufacturers such as Boeing and Douglas against each other. The Clipper services establishing long-distance over-water services, first Caribbean, then Atlantic and Pacific routes, were essential for Pan Am to ensure dominance. While Tripp started out providing luxury services with his Long Island Airways, he was the first to expand the market to the middle classes by establishing tourist class fares between New York and London, $275 in 1945. This drew the ire of competing flag carriers in the IATA cartel, and Britain closed its airports to Pan Am, forcing the airline to fly to Shannon Airport in Ireland. Tripp introduced jet aircraft, the Boeing 707, in 1958, which were faster, higher, and carried twice the load. Tripp created the jet set with the transatlantic jet services, but then brought the jet set within reason by continuously lowering costs and prices. While the 707 had a cost of 4.1 cents per seat kilometer, he wanted to lower that further, which could only be achieved with greater economies of scale. A new class of still larger jets was needed. To that end, he told Boeing, if you build it, I'll buy it, to which Boeing CEO William Allen replied, if you buy it, I'll build it. The supplier-customer relationship was not simply a market transaction, but involved significant negotiation. Aircraft were far from a perfectly competitive market, and at the time, the same was true of airlines. Pan Am was intimately involved in the design of the 747, including ensuring that part of the upper deck would be for passengers. While the 747 was ultimately a very successful aircraft, still in widespread use, it had such high fixed costs that it almost bankrupted both Pan Am and Boeing. Pan Am was hit hardest by rising oil prices in the 1970s, which forced it to raise fares and reduce demand. Tripp died in 1981, and Pan Am merged with National Airlines, a Miami-based domestic carrier. The airline failed in 1991 for a variety of reasons, including, among them, the December 1988 Lockerbie bombing sponsored by Libya. Twelve point two system evolution. Like many technologies, there were many false starts. The first manned flight may have been in 559, when the emperor's son, 
Yuan Huang Tu of Ye, China, was forcibly strapped to a kite and set airborne from a tower. Yuan Huang Tu was later executed, and this experiment did not lead to any follow-on. The French Montgolfier brothers designed and took off in a hot air balloon in 1783 with others, which is credited as the first manned free flight. In 1891, German Otto Lilienthal flew in a glider. By 1898, internal combustion engines were powering airships, dirigibles, designed and flown by Brazilian Alberto Santos Dumont. Numerous other pioneers made attempts. Coming to the United States as an observer to the American Civil War, representing Württemberg, Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin decided to explore the North American frontier. While staying in St. Paul, Minnesota, he encountered a fellow German who had served for the Union, inflating a hot air balloon. It was here Count Zeppelin first went airborne in 1863. Almost half a century later, in 1909, the Zeppelin company he founded was facing financial difficulties, selling airships to the German military, and decided to start an airline, d -Log. While it was not at first successful in organizing regular service, it did provide some, but logistical support from the Hamburg America steamship lines, marking the first commercial airline. By 1914, D-Log had made over 2,000 flights, totaling 160,000 kilometers, carrying 34,028 passengers. World War I changed the nature of airship use in the German military's interest. By war's end, almost 100 airships had been used for the German Army and Navy. More than half were lost, indicating lower success than hoped for and significantly underperforming airplanes. Still, the Americans showed some interest, and after the war, the U.S. Navy ordered some airships from the Zeppelin Company as part of reparations payments, to the anger of some Germans who disapproved of the technology transfer. In an assassin sculpt, Dr. Hugo Eckener, the manager of the Zeppelin Company. Eckener almost stood for president of Germany against Hitler, but stepped aside when war here, Count von Hindenburg chose to run against. Prior to the 1938 LZ-129 Hindenburg, named for the Count, disaster in Lakehurst, New Jersey, no passenger had died to a, due to a crash of a Zeppelin airship. Transatlantic airship travel was not doomed due to this one well-publicized crash, but rather to the rise of Pan American Airways flights, which were much faster, though less comfortable. Though there was an attempt to convert future airships, such as the LZ-130 Graf Zeppelin II, to helium rather than hydrogen, the U.S. government withheld helium supplies under the 1937 Neutrality Act. Lifting vehicles have been available for centuries, kites, gliders, balloons, and as propulsion systems came along, there were efforts to apply them. An early assumption was that vehicles would emulate birds, and that assumption continued with respect to control of flight into the 1920s, even after the propeller was adopted, and well after the Wright brothers flew with a fixed wing in 1903. In hindsight, we know that the developers of the times took an overly simplistic view of the way bird flight is controlled. The system began to evolve in the 1920s in, in overwater market niches. Important actors were Pan American Airlines and producers of flying boats. Commercially viable planes were produced, corporate management and passenger interrelations were worked out, and there was important development of en-route control systems. Although where national borders were crossed, firms had to make arrangements for rights to provide service, and there was airmail subsidy, governments were not in much involved in the 1920s and early 1930s. Overland commercial systems began to evolve in the 1920s, but their birth is best marked at about 1935 by the development of the DC-3, a suitable aircraft for such services. While Boeing's Model 247 was the innovative aircraft combining the best of existing know-how, Douglas's DC-2 and DC-3 were larger and faster and flew farther. In particular, the DC-3 got it right for then conditions, size, velocity, and cost. It was the Model T of aircraft, so to speak. At about that same time, suitable aircraft for other markets began to evolve. The Gypsy Moth and the Piper Cub for recreational flying, the Norseman for Arctic flying, fighter and bomber aircraft, and so on. Evolution of the system includes more than equipment. Aids to en route navigation evolved. The 1930s saw development of the AM radio range, suitable voice communication radio, tower and en route traffic control, weather forecasting, and so on. Air traffic control improvements introduced after World War II, including changing to FM beacons and the use of radar. The airmail subsidy played a major role. Heavy government involvement in the 1930s included the development of the precursor to the Federal Aviation Administration and government regulation along the railroad model. Management of labor disputes was handled by the Railroad Labor Relations Board. Costs were set for passenger travel using tapered per mile rates. Established during the 1930s, regulations shared an aim of trucking regulation, protect existing operators from new entrants. Policy was also concerned with service to small communities. There was the requirement that small community service be included in the root structure of firms 
and a minimum level of service provided. Regulation kicked new firms out of the business. Even so, old firms were able to increase service areas, and service was gradually increased in the larger markets. Complex classes of fares had been introduced along with hubbing. Indeed, O'Hare Airport in Chicago was a hub for DC-6 service as early as the 1950s. The situation was quite similar in other nations. However, during this period, they were more affected by the winds of war. The increased internationalization of air travel after World War II drove an international policy agenda beginning in the late 1940s. As part of that, a debate in the United States continued from 1930 about whether there should be a recognized U.S. flag carrier. The United Nations, established at the end of World War II, became involved in air transportation rather early on through its International Civil Aviation Organization, the ICAO. In the early days, services had mainly been from small, privately owned fields, many not much improved over pastures. All that was needed was a level grass field and a shack or so. Some people suggested that train stations, which already had passenger facilities in long, straight stretches of land, could be adapted to serve as airports as well. That was not to be, as airplanes need runways pointing in specific alignments. Train station architecture was, however, adapted to serve airports. As DC-3 service came along, longer runways and pavements were needed. Airports began to be developed by cities. Airports provided a gateway to a city, and they enabled the city to participate in the air system. On the heels of World War II, many military fields adjoining cities were obtained for commercial use. Although a few airports have been constructed from scratch, in the main, the former military fields have been expanded to accommodate traffic growth. In metropolitan New York, Newark Airport was the first major facility with paved runways and runway lights. It was followed by LaGuardia. When Robert Moses misstepped and proposed raising rates to Eddie Rickenbacker, the aviator running Eastern Airlines, at the new Idlewild, later John F. Kennedy Airport, Eastern left for Newark. To avoid such intra-metropolitan competition, which was good for the airlines, not so good for the airport owners, New York Mayor O'Dwyer transferred control of New York City's airports to the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which soon controlled Newark Airport as well as, as Port Newark. The Port Authority was modeled on the Port of London Authority and was established in response to inefficiencies during World War II mobilization, World War I mobilization. Its territory encompassed all the area within a 35-mile radius of the Statue of Liberty. Twelve point three, airmail. Mail has been used to justify U.S. federal involvement in transport since the beginning of the Constitution. Mail subsidies aided the railroads. Similarly, airmail contracts were the savior for young airlines. Melville Kelly authored the Contract Air Mail Act of 1925 and the Foreign Air Mail Act of 1928, collectively called the Kelly Acts, which used the post office to subsidize and ensure monopolies for given origin destination pairs. The mail contracts covered the costs of flights, enabling airlines to sell seats for a profit. In 1930, the Waters-McNary Act enabled the Postmaster General to award competitive airmail contracts to the lowest responsible bidder, rather than simply the lowest bidder. This made the Postmaster General, Walter Folger Brown, who helped draft the act, a virtual czar over the airlines, determining their fate. The main three east-west routes were given to United Airlines, controlled by Boeing at the time, the Northern Route, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Transcontinental Western Airways, the Middle Route, New York, St. Louis, Los Angeles, and American Airways, the Southern Route, Washington, Dallas, Los Angeles. Eastern Airlines was awarded the main North-South Route on the East Coast, Boston, New York, Miami. Braniff was later awarded a North-South Route connecting Chicago and Dallas, and Delta was given a route connecting Charleston with Dallas. These big six continued to dominate U.S. domestic air travel until the era of deregulation and their hubs or hubs of successor airlines, are still located in the cities they received contracts for in 1930, showing the effects of lock-in. Airmail was expected to become standard by many prognosticators. Roger W. Babson was an investor, serial college founder, and 1940 Prohibition Party candidate for president of the United States. He wrote, within the next 50 years, practically all airmail and most of the express will be carried by airplanes. When a standard commercial plane is developed, the depreciation charges can be reduced so that the cost of carrying passengers and light freight will be less by plane than by rail. When this comes, at least one-third of the railroad mileage will be scrapped. It was not the plane that caused the railroad to scrap mileage, but more so the truck, and general consolidation trends as discussed in Chapter 21. The prediction was generally accurate, though. As an amusing side note, there have been several attempts to use rockets or missiles to deliver the mail. In 1931, Friedrich Schmeidel launched a V-7 rocket with 102 letters in Austria. In 
1934, Gerhard Zucker used powder rockets in the United Kingdom. In 1934, Stephen Smith used rockets to deliver some mail in India. In 1936, rockets containing letters were launched and landed in Greenwood Lake, New Jersey. The U.S. announced its first official missile mail, despite the obvious antecedents, in 1959 when letters launched from a submarine on a cruise missile hit a target in Mayport, Florida, and was then brought to Jacksonville, Florida for sorting and delivery. In the end, rocket mail has thus far been a technological dud. Twelve point four discussion. As can be seen in the figure, the median passenger weighted airport among the top thirty as of two thousand and six was founded in the early nineteen forties. The era of new airports is over, and the rate of new important airports during the world system is very low. Large hubworthy cities have airports, and while new cities may join the world system, all the best cities have been founded. Hubs at these airports persist. Airports which are hubworthy tend to get attached to specific airlines. The three large network carriers in the U.S. systems around 2012, American, United, and Delta, and their largest recent merger partners, U.S. Airways, Continental, and Northwest, respectively, are shown in the table. Early airmail routes from the post office or passenger routes granted by the Civil Aeronautics Board were sufficient to establish hub lock-in some 90 years later. Not all early carriers survived. Braniff, Eastern, Pan Am, and TWA are some of the largest names not to have made it to the present day, though several were acquired rather than dissolved. Consolidation in aviation, as other transport modes, is an important story. Students of business history can map the particulars, but for instance, American Airlines was the product combination of 72 earlier companies, Northwest of eight, and so on. First mover advantage is strong despite the mobile capital in the airline sector.